Good afternoon, everybody. Happy St. Valentine uh, to everybody out there. I hope you guys uh, all made your plans. There's still a little time if you haven't after we get done today, so good luck on that one. <laughs> anyway, on B uh, my name is Frank Chalet, president of the Parkinson's Resource Center of Spokane, at least for one more month. Uh, and on behalf of uh, Northwest Parkinson's, uh, team out of Seattle and the PRC of Spokane. I'd like to welcome all of you here today in Spokane and in the many communities joining us for today's telehealth uh, presentation. Uh, of course, I'd, I'd very much like to thank our sponsors who continue to support us and also our supporters uh, uh, month in and month out. Uh, Northwest Telehealth for producing today's program. They do an outstanding job. Our host, St. Luke's Rehabilitation Center uh, for providing the venue for us. Uh, as well as the refreshments and things in the back, so please do help yourself. And, of course, our sponsors, uh, Northwest Parkinson's, again, uh, for partnering up with us, uh, Albertsons, and for their ongoing generosity in supporting our efforts to provide education and outreach, and, of course, our uh, PRC uh, Board of Directors and staff. And I'd also like to thank all of you here today uh, in Spokane and all of our sites not only for joining us today, but uh, for your many contributions uh, over time to support telehealth. And last but not least, of course, I'd like to thank our volunteers for helping to make this happen, uh, especially Jackie Ewell, who is our uh, volunteer coordinator, uh, Walt and Shirley Jakubowski, who are supporting us today, uh, Maggie Bai, and Shirley Hernandez. So uh, thank you to our volunteers. Uh, as uh, is... Uh, uh, protocol that we've used in the past. I'd ask uh, the remote sites as well as everybody here to hold their questions uh, until the end of the presentation. And those of you at the remote sites, if you'd please uh, mute your microphones uh, until the presentation is over, and then I'll remind you to turn those back on. Well, we're, uh, we have two very special guests today. I think you're going to find this very intriguing, interesting, uh, and uh, two different uh, folks that are going to talk about Gamma Knife and uh, provide... Uh, a lot of terrific information that I think you'll find uh, very interesting. Our two speakers today are Dr. Christopher Lee. Uh, he is uh, radiation oncology uh, and also has advanced training in state-of-the-art radiotherapy. Uh, he's going to talk to us today. And also uh, Barton Bocook. Uh, Bocook is operations director of Gamma Knife of Spokane. So without further ado, please welcome our first speaker, Bocook. Thank you. I appreciate that. Also, I'd like to uh, thank Ed and Jackie Ewell for uh, making the Parkinson's Resource uh, Center a, a very real thing. And I remember being at the beginnings of that, uh, of that discussion in um, Spokane, and uh, many of us are very, very privileged to have people who are so gracious and generous with their time and their, their uh, resources to make that happen. So uh, an acknowledgment to the two of you. Ed and I, uh, yes. Ed and I have a have an agreement that with his Parkinsonian trimmer and my essential trimmer that we can never really eat at the same table because we cause a, a major ruckus. And since our favorite place is Chaps down at uh, down off the Pullman Highway, Celeste is our friend, so we kind of like to spread our crumbs in two different directions. But, but as a, as a as a, as a, the, the managing partner and. Uh, operations director of the Gamma Knife Center, um, I have an opportunity to talk to patients and I have an understanding of what goes on with them. But no one more connected than when I talk to somebody who has an essential tremor or Parkinsonian tremor because of the fact that my I have one that's fairly pronounced and that's why it didn't even work out this morning. If I did my workout, then you guys would start to you know, have a problem watching as slides would go by as my hand would do something weird. Um, but my brothers have them too. And, and uh, one is a battalion chief out in the Valley Fire Department. Um, he is possibly going to be a candidate for either most likely not DBS, but a gamma knife uh, because he has to do some pretty intricate stuff. And he even had it when he was a, a, a paramedic. That makes it difficult. There, there are things that we, I have to, actually when I go in and make a presentation to neurosurgeons or neurologists, I have to lead with that because I'm, I'm a bit animated. So people have all kinds of, he must be detoxing or something. He, well, here's a problem. But people have a strange idea when they look at you and your hand is doing something funny, or I reach out and pull down a screen and it goes all over the place. People misread us. 
And so for those of you who have the tremors, I understand. So I, I have to lead with that because often neurologists start staring at my hand. And I go, oh, oh by the way. So I understand how that happens. So, th so under th let's start with that. I know where you're coming from. So th what I'd like to talk about and what Dr. Lee would like to talk about is Gamma Knife. And there are really three centers, one in, one in Pittsburgh, one in Swedish Hospital, used to be Northwest Hospital in Spokane, are the real three centers that are doing anything with the central tremor or Parkinsonian tremor with the Gamma Knife. Um, the unique nature of the gamma knife is that it fixes the head in a in a head frame it kind of like it looks and we're going to show you what it looks like here in a minute but it's kind of like a halo for somebody who might have broken their neck and then we have a machine that has a fixed isocenter that focuses on a very precise place and the patient's head is moved in relation to where that fixed isocenter is if you can picture using a uh, uh, a magnifying glass with the power of the sun focused on one spot, you can start a fire. That's the same thing. It's radiation from 201 sources focusing on one spot. So it's the movement of that, the head and placing a very precise shot of radiation. That's about 10 times the amount that would be used to kill a, a brain tumor to create to, to, and, and I'm, I'm stepping on his stuff. I'm not going to get into stuff. But that's why it's very precise. Fixing the head in a fixed isocenter gives us sub-millimeter accuracy. So very, very accurate. So precision you can count on and experience you can trust. And the reason we say the experience you can trust, let's see if this works here. Oh, it is. This is a television commercial that has been running on Oprah and the doctor show for the last, uh, for the last year and a half. Can you hear this? I know what you're thinking. Poor thing, she must have cancer. And I do, but I'm no victim. When they told me the cancer had spread to my brain, I knew I was in for the fight of my life. So I looked into all my options, and I chose Gamma Knife from Spokane. Carrie, how you doing? Good. Gamma Knife from Spokane offers state-of-the-art, one-time precise radiation treatment that can get you home the very next day. Focused, effective, a knockout punch. Of all the options presented, I think I made the right choice. When you're in for the fight of your life, you need the best team in your corner. Gamma Knife of Spokane, the proven standard of care. So we are a cancer center, but also because of the precision, we also can handle uh, trigeminal neuralgia, which other centers can't with their radiation, and, and of course, the essential tremors or or uh, Parkinsonian tremors. Unmatched accuracy, unparalleled experience, and outstanding outcomes. And um, since 2002, if we can get that up there a little bit, but since 2002, we were averaging about 200 patients per year. Um, that's more than any other Gamma Knife Center in the state of Washington. It includes the three in Seattle. It includes Portland, includes Eugene, includes uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. And, and we're, um, uh, because, of the, because of the patient volume through this, we have two neurosurgeons only that treat the patients. So if you can understand that Dr. Alex McKay, whose office is right over here um, across the hall, he treats on average 150 of those 200 patients himself every year. So you have unmatched, unmatched uh, experience as far as uh, neurosurgeons go. Dr. Lee... Dr. Lamoureux um, and Dr. Fairbanks are part of that, the radiation oncology team. It requires a neurosurgeon and a radiation oncologist, medical physicist. To give you a perspective, there is a cyber knife in Montana, highly publicized. They will do about 30 patients a year. Um, the brain lab over here at Sacred Heart, I think you guys uh, might have met uh, Dr. Jonathan Carlson. Terrific program, terrific guy. Um, but they will average 25 to 40 patients a year, and we average 200. Um, and we've been on operation, like I say, since June. Here are the neurosurgeons, uh, Dr. Alex McKay and Dr. John Demacus. And Dr. Neil Giddings is one of, if, if, to give you perspective on who these people are, um, there are 12,000 neuro, uh, um, ear, ear, nose, and throat surgeons in the United States. 300 of those are neuroautologists. Of those, only 12 
do acoustic neuromas with the gamma knife, and Dr. Giddings was the third one in the country to do it. Our outcomes are significantly impressive and rival, if not exceed, any other outcomes on hearing preservation and facial numbness in, in the country. Here are the radiation oncologists. They're even better looking in, in person. Dr. Chris Lee, who's here, you'll see, and Dr. Robert Fairbanks, Dr. Wayne Lamoureux. The rest of these characters are the people that you, your, you or your loved one would interact with. The nurse, Jill Adams, up there on the left-hand corner. Larry Bornderin, our medical physicist, we try to keep him away from patients. He's from Long Island, and he's grouchy. So, uh, but he's very good. 35 years doing medical physics. He's very, very good. Um, Eric Reynolds and Liza Carlson round him up, and I don't know who the other guy is. So I'm going to hand it over to uh, Dr. Christopher Lee, and he'll explain the technology, but then also talk about the targeting and the precision of the gamma knife. Thanks very much. Thanks, Bo. I am uh, Chris Lee. I'm one of three radiation oncologists at the Gamma Knife, and I've uh, been here in Spokane for about five years, so I'm one of the newer transplants here to town. Um, usually when people think about radiation oncologists, they uh, um, imagine uh, us uh, sitting in a dark room, um, imagine x-rays or maybe nuclear explosions or things like that, and... Uh, um, don't understand exactly what the day-to-day -day life of a radiation oncologist is. Ninety percent of the, the time that I spend in, in, in clinic and in the hospital is, is sitting down with patients face-to-face -face and discussing what symptoms they're having from, in most cases, cancer or other ailments that are affecting them that can be treated with radiation oncology. And my field has changed significantly over the last five to eight years. Um, the majority of that is due to computer technology, due to imaging, due to uh, uh, everything being on a microchip now where we can see parts of the brain, image parts of the brain, and focus tiny little areas um, of the brain. We can focus on those spots and deliver high-energy high energy, x-rays through very sophisticated mapping techniques to treat and ablate, uh, in, this, in this situation, areas of the brain that cause tremors. Um, this is an illustration or a cartoon of, of what the gamma knife looks like in cross-section. And what you can see here is, if I can get the pointer to work, there we go. This here is called a collimator. And in this diagram, you can see there are lots of little uh, spheres or circles that are in this collimator. There are actually 201 of these spheres that are all focused all the way around that collimator device onto one central point. And Bo uh, mentioned briefly that we call this the isocenter. Knowing spatially where that point is located, we can use a head frame device, which is a circular halo that goes over the, over the forehead. We use four little pins. We anesthetize four spots on the skin with lidocaine and place pins through the skin and into the outer aspect of the skull to hold that in place. It does not go into the brain. But what that does is it, it uh, holds the patient's head position in a very specific spot. And by adjusting X, Y, and Z coordinates, we can then focus those 201 radiation beams on any part of the brain that we choose. It has to be exact, of course, when dealing with the brain because of all of the surrounding exquisite and, and critical structures that we want to protect. When the patient is positioned here in this device, the device then moves into the machine and docks with another station that fits it perfectly, um, actually here, and it's lined up with these uh, chambers that hold all the way around that array 201 little uh, radioactive cobalt sources that are giving off radiation. The procedures that we do are varied. Um, this machine is, is specifically set up for treating things in the brain. It doesn't treat other areas of the body. But the majority of what we deal with is cancer. We treat uh, tumors that have metastasized to the brain. Uh, benign brain tumors, we treat tumors that 
um, start in other parts of the body and, and spread to the brain and also tumors that start in the brain to begin with. AVMs uh, that's listed on the right hand side, these are uh, vascular malformations that are in the brain that can spontaneously bleed and cause strokes. And Gamma Knife is a way of treating those uh, in a single dose, a single uh, visit to our clinic, we can treat these AVMs without requiring the patient to undergo an open surgery and have this part of the skull removed and, and uh, that uh, vascular area uh, removed or embolized, we can do this with a non-invasive technique. We also use this for, for patients who have tremors, either Parkinsonian trem tremors or essential tremors. Again, by mapping out and treating that specific spot in the brain that causes the, the tremor. We put a slide in here just to illustrate that uh, in addition to treating patients uh, in the clinic, we also have an active research program. We have medical students, residents, we have pre-medical students who work with us. Um, we have summer fellowships. Um, if you have uh, uh, people in your family who are interested in clinical research and are interested in participating, let us know. We have projects that people work on uh, the, to analyze the results, the effectiveness of our treatments. And we've been uh, very lucky here to have grant support and other support from the Breast Cancer Society and other places where we, we've now published our results for many of our treatments, have ongoing analyses, and we've even been asked to write some textbook chapters on these techniques that we do. So we have some expertise there that we uh, would like to continue to, to expand and continue to uh, make a difference in how we do treatments. Today we're specifically talking about essential tremors and Parkinsonian tremors and and as Bo mentioned earlier we know that there are many patients out there who are affected by this. Um, patients who um, because of their tremor it affects the activities of daily living, it affects the ability to eat or uh, ability to um, uh, do their occupation or go about uh, uh, doing things that they enjoy, painting and other, other hobbies. There are um, many very sensitive areas in the brain and in order to understand how to treat these Parkinsonian or essential tremors, we need to understand those areas of the brain and understand what areas can be affected uh, to cause a difference. There's a specific uh, nucleus that's in the uh, uh, central, that's in the uh, center of the uh, brain that we focus on. This is a cross section of a brain MRI that shows at the time of the treatment on the left hand side here shows where we have made some measurements and mapped out this specific VIM nucleus and focused 201 beams on a small four millimeter spot. That's done and, and radiation is delivered to that area and after that was done, serial MRIs are done in the future to see how well, number one, did we target the spot and if there were any other, er any other issues due to the treatment. And as you can see on this patient's MRI that was done as a follow-up, you can see exactly where that spot was located. The treatment was exactly where we wanted it to be. Um, verification that we hit the target in the, and uh, verification that it's causing some changes in that region, uh, similar, this, this is uh, actually the similar location or the same location for patients who are undergoing uh, deep brain stimulation as, as also an option for this. Um, but this is verification that we can do this with accuracy without the patient needing to undergo brain surgery, without having to uh, uh, stop medications to undergo that procedure. Patients who are um, uh, on blood thinners or other uh, cardiac medications that can't undergo this procedure. This allows us to treat that with high specificity and high accuracy and accomplish the same goal. There are many papers out there about this. Uh, uh, we've published a few of them and there are other papers that have been published in Europe and other places in the country. Um, this is a, a paper out of Rhode Island where they found that uh, radiation for the treatment of tremor in patients uh, or MS as well as treatment of essential tremor may be indicated in a select group of patients with advanced age, significant medical conditions that preclude treatment with open surgery or patients who must receive anticoagulation. 
so patients can continue on all of their same medications. They can come in and have, receive a non-invasive radiation treatment where at the end of the day, the head frame comes off, we put four Band-Aids over those four spots, um, and the patient can go home. And, and it, by doing that, we can have uh, very high accuracy in treating the area that needs to be treated and, and good success. This is a five-year experience that was published in LA. Um, and um, what they're looking at in this paper is uh, also the effectiveness of, of doing radiosurgery for patients with tremor. And they found also that although in their study, although less effective than other stereotactic techniques, gamma knife radiosurgery for, for thalamotomy offers good tremor control with minimal risk. So again, patients who can't undergo the surgery, who don't have the option or the opportunity to have that surgical procedure done, this can be a good option. This is one of our papers, uh, a review of the literature on a specific patient that we treated here who um, I think uh, her story really brings home the value of what we do. This was uh, a patient who uh, was, a, was a practicing nurse and because of her tremor was unable to continue to do the things that she enjoyed at home as uh, painting and, and those types of hobbies as well as was unable to practice nursing anymore. She couldn't draw blood, she had trouble with uh, placing needles and was unable to continue her occupation. Prior to her treatment, if you look on the upper line here, she was asked to draw some examples of some figures here, as well as to draw within this maze here a line that didn't touch the outer lines. After her treatment, um, about six months after, this was what she could do. Um, much better. Uh, in her steadiness and ability to draw and to replicate the drawing that was there to stay within the lines. And she was unable to paint uh, due to her tremor. Well, because of the results of her radiosurgery, she was able again to resume her, her painting and resume her hobbies. And this is a painting that she drew that uh, um, we have hanging up in our office uh, that, uh, that she gave to her neurosurgeon because of her, her uh, to give thanks for being able again to, to do the things that she enjoyed in life. This is another case where a patient uh, couldn't stay within the lines again and afterwards had significant improvement. And in this one, you can see it's not perfect. Um, not, you know, it's not a 100% score here, but it significantly improved from uh, a baseline where being able to do activities of daily living was very difficult. This is, again, an illustration of the day prior to Gamma Knife, one month after Gamma Knife, and then three months after. The way that radiation works is different than DBS or deep brain stimulation. Uh, with DBS procedures, oftentimes within a few days, you have remarkable results. The radiation, because of the way that it works and because of the effects um, Due to the, radi due to the uh, radiation ablation, the effects happen over time. It's a, it's a buildup of effects over months. And so we have to reassure patients that two days after we're done, a week after we're done, a month after we're done, there's, the radiation is still having an effect, still causing changes um, at, a, at the cellular level that will continue to uh, improve over time. The studies that are out there, and, and uh, we just recently published uh, this year a, a review article on, on all of the published results that are in the literature, show that treatment with radiosurgery is 80% effective in patients who have this situation. Not all 80% have 100% have improvement, uh, but 25 to 50% of those who undergo treatment have near complete improvement of their tremor on the affected side and 80% of patients do have clinical improvement due to the treatment. So we're very excited and very um, pleased with the results that we've seen here at this center as well as with our collaborations with other centers um, who are doing this for patients. Uh, excited to be able to offer this here in Spokane, which is unique for a city of this size to be able to have this technology. 
as Bo mentioned earlier, the next gamma knives in the country are in Seattle or in Portland or down in Salt Lake City where I came from five years ago. Um, stop there. Stop for questions. Well, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. Uh, very interesting, and I'm sure there's lots of questions out there. Um, before I, um, and I'd ask the remote sites to please uh, turn on their microphones uh, so we can hear you when you ask a question. Uh, before um, I start uh, uh, calling on our folks out there to ask questions, um, I'll start off with the first one. Uh, I'm sure people are kind of curious about how does Gamma Knife and for uh, central tremors and central tremors whatnot uh, differ from the DBS type of treatment that's out there today? Can you address that? It's a good question, and that's that's uh, usually one of the first questions that every patient asks us who comes to discuss this technology. And the main difference is that uh, one is an invasive procedure and the other is a non-invasive procedure. Um, the uh, the way that the DBS is done is a surgical procedure done by a neurosurgeon who who places uh, the device in that precise location manually. With radiosurgery, we do uh, mapping with a um, MRI scan, one millimeter slice thickness, to be able to uh, map out the anatomy of the brain and treat in a non-invasive way. And as we've uh, written and others, as we wrote in our review article and others have published, we feel that this is um, this should be an option that patients should have available to them. And there are there are some situations where um, patients can't undergo the uh, the surgical procedure because of medical uh, other medical problems. Again, we discussed the blood thinners. The um, some patients uh, because of age or other uh, cardiac or lung problems are unable to undergo the surgery. Where this is a a good option. Other patients uh, who are good candidates for surgery should also have the option. Should also understand that this doesn't uh, take effect as quickly. That's one, one difference. It can take time for the radiation to have the full effect. Um, and uh, it's important, we feel, for patients to have the information so that they can make the decision on what fits them, what's the best option for them in, uh, in, their, you know, in their specific situation. So. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Okay, so let's move on uh, to the Q&A session. And uh, I'll try to mix it up a little bit so we don't use the same type of approach. But let's uh, start uh, with our friends at Providence Alaska Medical Center in Anchorage. Uh, any questions out there for O. Cook or Dr. Lee? No, we don't have any questions at this time. Ask if there's any side effects from the radiation. Are, are there any side effects from the radiation? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there can be, and it, it de for this specific technique, actually, we use a very high dose of radiation that can ablate um, neural structures. That's, that's the goal of it. Um, key to avoiding side effects, such as numbness or affecting motor skills or, or uh, um, seizure activity, are being able to map things out specifically and experience. Um, every patient that we talk to, uh, it's not dissimilar or not not much different than patients undergoing the brain stimulation procedure. Placing those devices also have risk of, of causing harm to a, to the adjacent brain. Um, we're doing the same thing just with a non-invasive technique, and so there's risk of seizure, risk of, of uh, numbness, risk of uh, weakness, all of those things that are also related to uh, the nucleus location and its surrounding critical neurons. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, let's uh, go to Moses Lake Samaritan Hospital. Uh, any questions? No questions. All right, thank you. Uh, Walla Walla, Providence St. Mary's. No question. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, Billings, Montana. Deaconess Billings. Any questions, folks? Uh, 
DBS can get the knife done. I'm sorry, can you repeat that, please? The DBS has a gammon. We're not uh, getting the full question, sorry. If you could restate that. If you have had the DBS surgery, can you have the gamma knife surgery done? That's a good question. Um, in, in most cases, um, in, in most cases, no. And it has to do with changes that occur at the time of placement of those, um, of those leads. And um, it changes the anatomy and it makes it difficult um, to have a predictable response from radiation. So um, that's, that's an area of study. And there may be in the future a way to, to uh, do that safely. But at this time, that's not something that we're doing routinely. Uh, is that an outpatient surgery? It is. Yeah, the gamma knife is a, a procedure where you come in in the morning, you have the head frame placed and, and go down for an MRI, and within uh, about two hours, you're done and ready to go home. Okay. And then what about, what about risks and what about return visits? Um, the risks of the procedure, uh, um, again, are a risk of injury to that that critical area of the brain, um, it can cause, due to swelling and inflammation in that four millimeter spot, it can cause an increased risk of seizure. Um, it can cause headache or swelling, which we would treat with, with a steroid for a short period of time. Um, it ca can cause a risk of uh, causing uh, numbness. Uh, the patient that I discussed earlier who uh, uh, drew the painting for her neurosurgeon um, had a period of time where she had some numbness and that resolved over time. And so uh, and there can be effects due to, uh, again, the radiation targeting that specific area of the brain. There isn't the risks of, of uh, hemorrhage or bleeding or infection like you would have with surgery. Is it covered by Medicare? Um, it is covered by Medicare, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And what about return uh, uh, re visits after the procedure? Yeah, it's a, a, to finish your last question, it's a proven treatment. And so, yes, it's covered for patients who, who have it. Um, we follow patients uh, with, with MRI scans on a periodic basis, usually one month after treatment. We get the first MRI, and then every three months after that for the first, uh, first year to 18 months, depending on uh, how patients' tremors are responding. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Okay, let's move on to Othello Community Hospital. Any questions out there, folks? Okay. All right. Uh, Tenasket, North Valley Hospital. No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Tri-State Tri -State Memorial in Clarkston, please. Hi. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Does this procedure only address the one symptom of, of uh, Parkinson's, which is the tremors, or does it help in any other spot, such as balance problems and so forth like that? And then I have another question after that. Uh, yes, it's it's only to address the tremor. That's the purpose of the treatment, is to reduce the tremor um, on that side. So it doesn't really do much for people that have a balance problem and can fall on occasion? Yeah, it does not. It doesn't address that symptom very well. There, there are other targets that can be used with radiosurgery for bradykinesia and other... Um, other Parkinsonian issues, rigidity, um, those are less proven. Those are still being uh, studied and looked at um, both here and in Europe. Um, but those, those uh, targets and the outcomes are much less uh, published and less studied than treatment for tremors. Okay, one more question. Who would not be eligible for this procedure? Who would not be eligible? 
uh, you know, patients who have, patients who have Parkinsonian or essential tremors that are that are causing a, a deficit in their life um, are eligible. Um, there's really, uh, as we've stated and others in the literature, it should be an option that's available to all patients. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Evergreen Healthcare in Kirkland? I have a question. Can you hear me? If you have the gamma knife uh, procedure, and after that, can you have a D D DBS surgery? Uh, that's a good question. That's also, uh, uh, it has been done. Um, that's a very uh, small population of patients that, that uh, um, that, ha that has been done on their case reports, um, but no, that's not a that's not a routine thing that's done. Um, there's not a lot of literature out there on that. It sounds like it's either or. Thank you. It sounds like it's either or. Yeah. Any other questions? No, thank you. No. Thank you for your question. Uh, Bonner General Hospital in Sandpoint. <laughs> Any questions, folks? Okay, we can always come back to you. Uh, Kootenai Medical Center, Coeur d'Alene. All righty. Uh, Kennewick General Hospital. I'm sorry? <laughs> Turn me off in the middle. Of my... <laughs> Did you have a Wait. question? I'm sorry. Cooney has. Cooney Medical Center, a question? Yes, we have one question. Okay, please go. Uh, lots of comparison here between the DBS and the Gamma Knife. Uh, DBS, in my understanding, can be undone if necessary. I assume the Gamma Knife cannot be undone because it's destroying something, is that correct? That's correct, yeah, the, uh, it's an ablative technique and so um, uh, the way that the radiation works is it causes permanent changes there to the, uh, to the cells that are in that four millimeter target. And so it is not a procedure that you can go in and remove that area or there's, there's not a way to extract the radiation effects back out of that area, so. Thank you. Yep. Okay, Kennewick General Hospital. No questions, thank you. All right, thanks so much. Uh, Pullman Regional Hospital. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, Dayton General Hospital. Uh, we enjoyed the program, and there's no questions. But the program right, was thank excellent. You. Thank you for joining us. Okay, uh, the Public Library in Pendleton, Oregon. Uh, yes, we'd like to know if there is a failure rate or what the uh, odds of the failure rate would be. Yeah, the uh, the radiation is 80% 80 80 successful in causing improvements in both uh, Parkinsonian as well as essential tremors. Only 25 to 50 percent of the time is it a complete uh, improvement in those tremors. And so uh, the, additional, um, the additional 50 to, or 25 to 50 percent of those improvements are not complete improvement, which is actually very similar to published results in, in DBS, where patients get, get clinical improvements, but it doesn't necessarily take the tremor completely away. Oh, see if I can find a uh, slide here to illustrate that. I guess we've got one in here to... Anyhow, um, to quickly answer the question, the uh, there have been studies showing that even after seven years, there are clinical improvements. And so over time, there can be continued improvements year after year after you, 
year. Um, yeah, this one says, uh, this was a published paper in 2008, although there's a decrease of DBS effect on tremor at seven years, and even though further aging and comorbidities impact the well-being of patients, there's still relevant, uh, relevant benefit of DBS on few aspects of activities of daily living and quality of life for patients who have essential tremors. What about the cost if you're not Medicare eligible? Yeah, let me have Bo answer that. I don't, I don't deal with the cost, so. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, the, the benefit of having the Gamma Knife Center of Spokane be owned by physicians and, uh, and our organization, um, if you don't qualify for insurance and you have a debilitating tremor, we can talk with the hospital and we can make arrangements for that. So just because somebody doesn't have insurance, whether it's for cancer or whether it's for uh, an essential tremor or Parkinsonian tremor, that's not a, a factor. That doesn't play a factor into us. So get a, give us a call. If you do have issues, give us a call and we'll figure something out with you. Any other questions, folks? Pendleton still has one more question. Thank you so much. Okay, let's go to our Spokane audience. Uh, folks here in Spokane, any okay. questions? I guess we only get two. <laughs> oh, you had one, excuse me, you had one more question? Yes? Oh. <laughs> from Oregon, you get two. Okay, go ahead, Walt. A couple of questions. If I understood one of the slides, and I'm not sure if it was Bo or Chris who presented, uh, in the last five years, uh, there have been 22 procedures done uh, with tremors. Is that correct? And how many of those were with Parkinson's patients? Two. Okay. And another question concerns uh, at least a couple of the studies that you mentioned uh, kind of indicate the conclusions were that um, the gamma knife should be an option, but it sounded like they were saying DBS was the primary choice. Is that correct? Uh, I think that's a good way to, to look at it. Um, in most places in the country where gamma knife is not available, um, DBS is really the only option for many patients, and that's been, it's been utilized uh, much more widely. Uh, there's a lot... Uh, a greater depth, I guess, to the studies and the and the literature, um, because it's been used in so many, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of patients. Um, the uniqueness of this treatment is that it can also serve a subset of patients who either um, don't want to undergo an invasive brain surgery or who can't, and so. It, it's an option that has very good efficacy. It has uh, very good research behind it. But if you were to, to ask what's the gold standard, the gold standard is the DBS right now. And radiosurgery is a technology that is uh, just like surgery, surgical techniques are improving over time. Our ability to f focus and target and to study this is improving. And uh, it's an option. Let me add my uh, two cents to that, and it, and it has to do with a, on a personal side. You know, I've got a mom and I've got a brother that both need need to be treated, and my brother's very active. He's a firefighter, and for me, I, I snowboard and uh, wakeboard and mountain bike, road bike, lead replacements, because the leads for the DBS go right up underneath the, you know, the sternum, right? Um, and a lot of the research we see that the, frequently leads are broken if somebody's active. Now, Ed and I aren't going to be snowboard racing, but but for both of us, you just say, what kind of activity are we going to have? Um, so for me, it's a tough decision because the, that's that's a serious operation with gamma knife and ablating that section of the brain. There are some inherent risk to it. It seems to be less and less as we find out more and more about it. But bottom line is, I'm too active to have leads placed. So, and how bad does it have to get before I'm, I have to have some treatment? I don't know. But, but that, that, those are the decisions I make. Do I want a lead replacement? Do I have to have failure? And do I want people coming, you know, 
back inside my brain all the time, or am I, how lucky do I feel, almost like a Clint Eastwood movie, you know, how lucky do I feel with a gamma knife? That's, that's be really candid with you. Those are very difficult decisions to make. And how bad does that tremor have to get before you get treated? Good question. Any other questions, folks? In the, in the very back? Hold on one second, let her get the mic to you. Yes, thank you. Um, if someone has a gamma knife done, I know that there was a slide earlier that it showed with a deep vein stimulator um, after seven years or something, maybe there was a decrease in efficacy. How about with a gamma knife? I know up to three months you were showing there's continued improvement, but have you seen a decrease after a period of time? Yeah, the, the radiation works um, opposite in that actually over time it, it continues to cause improvement. And so um, the way that it affects the DNA within the cells there that are being targeted, then those effects, because neurons are very um, slow reacting tissue to the radiation, you can have clinical improvements that happen years down the road, clinical effects years later. My question is, how does Gamma Knife impact Parkinson's medications like Cinemet? What happens um, to the medications as this therapy starts to show some efficacy? And the, ho the hope is that, uh, in, that uh, in, in that situation, of course, we work very closely with their neurologists, and as a team, we work together in trying to optimize their medications. But um, the hope is that with time, as their tremors improve, some of those medicines uh, can be lowered um, if they're causing them side effects. You know, sometimes the medication's causing just as many side effects as the problem that it's treating. And um, it's a case by case, but the goal is to get them down on lower doses of medications and, and uh, to improve quality of life and uh, it's individualized. Just as a follow-up to that, are there any studies comparing gamma knife to DBS as far as the post-surgical reduction of meds? Um, that there, there actually aren't any head-to-head, -head, you know, there aren't any randomized controlled clinical trials, phase three trials. Um, and that has to do, uh, in most cases, with patients who have these procedures um, feel very strongly that they want one or the other. And so it's very hard to um, have that discussion with someone and, and for someone to make the decision that they'll be randomly assigned to an invasive brain surgery or a non-invasive surgery. Um, there are outcomes for both of them individually, but um, really not, not a study I can quote that's been done. Great question, though. It'd be nice to have that in the future. I'm from Grangeville, Idaho. May I ask a question? Absolutely. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay. I have Parkinson's. Um, my right hand is just starting to have a little bit of tremor. My right foot has, I guess it would be a dystonia. It's going out. And it, uh, sh my whole leg kind of shakes at times. What would this, would either one of the procedures help that? I think that's a, um, again, if, with each with each individual person, it would be a decision uh, with you and your and your physicians on how much it was affecting your daily activities. But yes, with respect to the tremor, with the shaking, um, either DBS or uh, gamma knife would be a potential option. Not, not so much for the rigidity. Yeah, I'm pretty good on that. I'm just my foot is just starting to go crazy every once in a while. So that's, huh. I'd like to cut it off. But, <laughs> um, but that's all. I was just. No, it's a very good question, and, and these are, you know, these are exactly the the challenges that we that we face and that we tackle each day when we're seeing patients is, is how far do you, you know, how far do you wait? How long do you wait before you do an intervention? And, and that is 
very dependent upon the individual and how aggressive they want to be and how much right now it's a, it's affecting their daily activities. So, thank you. Thank you very much. I get the impression that this is a one size fits all. You've talked about a four millimeter area. Uh, search the uh, radiation that I've dealt with through the years, we always have to be aware of the sensitivity in terms of size. Uh, when you imagine a, a very small lady under 100 pounds, is she going to have radiation the same way as somebody who was 220? <laughs> yeah, it's a, um, that's a very good question. Of course, each person's brain anatomy is, is a little different based on size, and so we use very de detailed measurements to map out the location first. The dose of radiation <coughs> is and the size of the area that we ablate is the same, but due to um, the way that the math and the physics calculations work, that due to the, the shape and the head position within that frame, the calculations are based from the surface of the skin down to that depth. So someone who has a smaller head circumference would get a, lo a lower dose than someone with a, l with a larger head circumference based on all of those beams entering and, and uh, from that point down to the depth of the, the target. Um, the prescription is the same at that depth, but the amount of time that the beam is left on through each of those 201 uh, cobalt sources is, again, dependent upon the distance. So. It, it, it's uh, the only way we can do that with precision is really be, by computer technology and um, now because of our ability to map things out, we can do it very precisely. Question. Yes. Go ahead and uh, still there. Um, I've heard in cancer treatments you can only have, once you have a treatment with radiation, should you have another event of treatment necessary years later, you can't go back and have radiation again. Is this the same, does this radiation through the gamma knife affect any other uh, need for radiation treatment for other illnesses? A great question. Uh, that's a, a misunderstanding that a lot of people have. and, and um, when you've had radiation example for, for breast cancer, um, and if you were to develop another cancer, a lung cancer or a, or a tumor that was a colon cancer down the road, radiation can be used again to those different sites. And so you don't, you don't burn any bridges by doing radiation for breast cancer for your ability to undergo this or another radiation course. What's, what's important is the specific area of the body that you treat if you needed to do further treatment to that specific four millimeter spot again, then then um, that would pose some risks. It would be a higher cumulative dose to that area, but uh, doesn't affect your ability to have other cancer treatments. Any other questions? Did you have a question, ma'am? Um, I find the use of the word knife very frightening. Is there a yeah. reason for that? <laughs> we don't like the name either. Um, but whoever named it, um, Lars Lexall, uh, many years ago, Lars, uh, when he named it, uh, they called it the Gamma Knife because um, it was a surgical tool. Um, there's no cutting involved with it. Um, it's an ablative technique. And so when we do this same type of technology in other areas of the body, um, then it's called an ablation. Rather than a rather than a knife, but that's a, not a very this friendly is, sounding term. This is Clarkston. We have one more question, please. Can this uh, gamma knife, gamma ray, whatever, can it be used to uh, help Tourette's syndrome? The, uh, you want to answer that? Yeah. Um, as, it, it's an excellent question. Um, if you notice from one of our slides, we, we show that the same target for Parkinsonian tremors is the same target for essential tremors. 
in the, the VIM, the VIM nucleus. So what was interesting is that we just saw something coming out of Cleveland Clinic where they were using DBS to affect um, a patient who had uh, um, a pretty severe Tourette syndrome. And he would turn it on with his garage door opener and boom, the guy would, was completely coherent and didn't have any of the, uh, any of the Tourette syndrome, those symptoms. Um, so the question, actually, the neurosurgeon or the neurologist that sent me that, that uh, image said, same target. So I think at this point, it, it, it begs some, uh, some research, some possibility of using that same targeted area for, for Gamma Knife as well as DBS. Usually, I think it's the DBS, the Medtronic guys are going to do all the research there and say, this is precisely the target, which is exactly the reason why Gamma Knife is used on the VIM nucleus now, is they were doing sub, some subthalamic targeting for DBS, and they found the most effective was the VIM nucleus. So now we all use that same spot, and we can predict within a millimeter of where that spot is going to be. So it's not an iffy thing. It's a very, very precise. And the reason we use a four millimeter collimator is that's the smallest collimator you can get. So it's so a good question. Um, yeah, it's just a matter of having the research out there that says, yeah, if DBS works there, then probably Gamma and I probably would work as well. Dr. Lee has something more here. Yeah, I was also going to add that there's, uh, in that same in that same vein, there are also studies going on looking at it for patients with schizophrenia and obsessive compulsive disorder, and there are, there are other um, research going on around the country and throughout the world looking at other targets to um, that could benefit from this technology. I was asked to illustrate uh, how big four millimeters is. Um, uh, it's quite a small target, and and uh, uh, it's about a, f a fifth of an inch, and so a very small area that we focus on uh, to create this effect. That was helpful uh, for us that never did learn the metric system, so we appreciate that. <laughs> well, you know, as always, these programs, and I'll get to them. Um, Just one more. Um, when did this start? How many years ago? The Gamma Knife has uh, been in town for eight or nine years now. So I was here before I got here five years ago, and, and uh, as, as we've continued to uh, do research and utilize it, the, the technique um, and our, our findings have just uh, continued to get better, so we're seeing more and more patients each year. Oh, um, Bo reminded me that uh, Ron Young, um, who's a neurosurgeon in Seattle, has been using it for about 12 years. You know, Gamma Knife technology has been around for uh, 20 years plus, and so it's it's not a it's not a new technique. It's something that's been studied and utilized for many many years for um, brain tumors and other um, both benign and, and other uh, vascular abnormalities. But just uh, this is one of the newer applications that's that's um, that's taking off. Any other questions? Okay. Um, excellent information, and I think it's uh, fair to say that, you know, similar to a lot of the things that uh, we learn every month uh, and all the different options that are available to you, it's make sure you're having those discussions, candid discussions with your healthcare providers, your physicians, you know, before you dive into any options. So uh, hopefully we've armed you with more information, uh, additional information that uh, you can use uh, to help you uh, in one way, shape, or form. And I just want to thank Dr. Lee and Bo Cook for an excellent presentation and for taking your time uh, to update everybody on this, on this option. Thanks for having us. Okay, a couple uh, housekeeping things. Uh, the next uh, telehealth is uh, the second Monday of the month, which is March 14th, and the speaker will be Dr. Christopher Rhodes. He's a neuropsychologist and director of the Memory Disorder Clinic at Virginia Mason Hospital out of Seattle, and the subject will be Parkinson's and sexuality, okay? Uh, as always, uh, today's program is available by DVD uh, by contacting uh, the PRC. Uh, at 509-473-2490, uh, or you can certainly go to our website at www.spokaneparkinsons.org. Again, I'd like to thank our sponsors, our supporters, uh, and our volunteers for all their efforts. And one last question here, Richard.
This will be broadcast from Seattle? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I already told him. I'm going to hand it to him. I don't know what happened to the rest of the people. Okay, so the next program, the question was, where is it going to be broadcast from? It will be uh, broadca broadcast excuse me, from Seattle. Okay. Um, and we have one last thing. Uh, Jackie, you want to come up? And Maggie, no, it's about volunteers. I plan to go, and then I forget about it. Yeah. I think it's a fourth Saturday. It's a Saturday, but I can't tell you which one well, it is. it seems to be... But you can be on a list of yeah. calls. Have any of you ever sent away for any of the <coughs> recording DVD? Yeah. Well, he can give you the phone number. We, can you hear me now? Okay. We need volunteers, and there are people who want to volunteer. We're not saying you've got to volunteer. And so we have a sheet here that tells a bunch of different things that are coming up, and it will change all the time because once we get somebody, we'll have something else probably. And so we're just here to um, give you one of these. You can give it to your kids, your neighbor, whoever. It doesn't have to be you. Um, what we're looking for is volunteers that can help out Kate at the office at the PRC located in the Deaconess building um, with office work, answering phones, um, sending out the newsletter each, um, do you send out monthly? Monthly. Um, just something that can help her a little bit. And then we're also looking for people who are willing to help out at the events, the Shaken But Not Stirred. Um, we have a big event coming up in June where we're going to need a lot of help. So not just for you to volunteer, but for your friends or family who are looking for volunteer opportunities. And there's also one in April, our big fest event. And then there's another one in July that we haven't talked about very much. But she's going to talk about the one in June. Hi, I'm Judy Sloan. And we're doing the first annual Festival of Speed out at Spokane County Raceway Park in Airway Heights on the weekend of June 3rd, 4th, and 5th. And it will be the first uh, vintage car race coming to Spokane. It will feature cars from the 50s, 60s, and 70s. These are race cars. This event has been held annually for over 20 years in Seattle and has benefited Children's Orthopedic Hospital these past 20 plus years. It started out the first year uh, that it was able to donate to the hospital about $1,200, $1,300. Last year was a down, month, uh, down year, and the event was able to give the hospital $500, almost $70,000. Um, our event here will be smaller to begin with. We want to start small and, and do it right. Um, it's going to be very, very exciting. We need volunteers. It's going to be a fun volunteer opportunity. Um, we will be, as the Parkinson's Resource Center, will be the prime beneficiary receiving all of the spectator admissions proceeds. Um, and so we will be uh, taking care of the ticket booth. We'll be having some booths for the PRC. We'll be handing out information about all of the activities and support groups we have and looking, of course, to more things that we can give to the Parkinson's community. Um, you or your family or your caregivers or your children, anyone who would like to help either within our office um, and to help Kate with all of the many, many tasks that she performs for us, but also at the race. Um, and also volunteers will be able to get into the race free. Otherwise, tickets for Saturday and Sunday would be $15 a day or $25 for the weekend. We will be selling cookies and water and anything and bracelets for the tremble claps and mugs and anything else that Shirley and Walt can come up with. <laughs> and it's going to it, we'll just, you name it, we'll sell it. Um, there was now um, a lot of the um, promotion for this event will start to begin. In fact, I just received a website today that's very exciting for um, one of the, the uh, main organizers, uh, uh, besides Sovereign, which is the Society for Vintage Racing Enthusiasts. That means older gentlemen racing beautiful cars on a racetrack. My husband told me it's just a parade. Well, it's not just a parade. <laughs> anyway, it's a real fun event, and um, we're looking to have um, 
all of you feel very, very much invited to participate, to attend, and anything you like. And please tell your family and friends, and you will start seeing quite a bit of promotion about it. Thank you. You can also ask me if you have any questions about anything or call the office, and I'll be glad to fill you in on anything I can. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful Valentine's Day, and uh, drive safely.